So we bless the Lord so much for uh, this morning. Uh, we'll still have our Bible study as usual from the book of Nehemiah. Principles for Christian service, principles for Christian leadership. We are drawing so much from that book. And, uh, let's just turn back to Nehemiah chapter 4. Again, for those who have not been here since we began learning the book of Nehemiah, we are looking at God's ordinary man for an extraordinary assignment. God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary missions. Every time you allow yourself to be used of God, you are allowing yourself to move out of the ordinary sphere and start operating in the supernatural sphere. Because whatever God does, everything that God does is supernatural. And God uses ordinary people, ordinary people, to achieve supernatural results. And we have taken the example of Nehemiah as one of the people that God is using to achieve his purpose. And uh, we have gone through Nehemiah. We have seen what he does. First of all, he gathers all the information concerning the problem of Jerusalem. So he gathers all the information because he doesn't want to act without information. So he gathers all the information concerning the problem that was in Jerusalem so that he can have a great insight. He can have a, an insight in what the problem is. He's not just rushing to go and solve a problem that doesn't have, he doesn't have an insight in. We saw that uh, after that, he takes an initiative. He takes an introductory action towards redeeming or solving the problem. So he understands the problem, but he takes the initiative, the introductory action to solve the problem. And how does he do that? One, he begins by presenting the request to God, prayer. He begins with prayer. So he presents the matters to God, knowing very well that he's the man for the job. That's the hardest thing to find in the body of Christ. Someone who knows that I'm the man for this job. I'm the woman for this job. And uh, I'm really laboring in Nehemiah, trusting that somebody will arise and say, I'm the man for the job. Whatever area that God points you to, you know that you are the one appointed for that, and uh, you do what is necessary. So Nehemiah prayed. What is the purpose of praying? To submit to God or to seek God's guidance, to involve God in what you are doing. So Nehemiah prayed as a sign of submission to a high authority, as a sign of involving God in what he was doing, uh, not calling God to join in later after things have gone wrong, no. Involving God from the beginning, that God is part of the ministry from the beginning. Then Nehemiah sought for help from the king because he knew he doesn't have what it takes materially to achieve the assignment ahead of him. So he sought for help from the king and we say that we should never be ashamed to seek for help from the people that God brings our way. Then, after he sought for help from the king, he set a timetable. He set a timetable. You don't just go to say, I will do it. Saying, I will do it without time limits is a waste of time. I think in chapter 2, verse 6 there, he set a timetable. He said, the king, this is the timetable that I'm going to use to do what I want to do. Then after he set a timetable, Nehemiah strategized. He planned. The problem of the church is we pray but never plan. We trust God. If you meet most believers, they are telling you we are waiting upon the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord. It has become a, a cliche for laziness. It's a good way of saying I'm lazy. Waiting upon the Lord. It's a spiritual way to say, I'm a lazy guy. Nehemiah planned, he strategized. And uh, after he strategized, he embarked on the assignment. So there was the actual now assignment. You don't just pray, plan, and leave things on papers. Have beautiful plans on papers, strategies on papers, but no action. Nehemiah swung into action, and uh, the first action was to mobilize, mobilize the workforce. 
mobilize the workforce. And after he had mobilized them, he was to motivate them and encourage them. The greatest encouragement he gave them was in chapter 2, verse 18. The greatest motivation he gave them was in chapter 2, verse 18, when he told them, And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's word that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to these good works. So the greatest motivation was, first of all, to convince these men and set their mind. So you see, it began by setting their minds on the work before they could set their hands on the work. Sometimes we push people to do things that their minds are not involved in, and that's why they give up in the middle. But if you are able to uh, motivate people, encourage people, show them the reason, convince them, and have their minds on the work, then when they set their hands on the work, that becomes easier. So the greatest motivation of Nehemiah was, number one, God is involved in what we are doing. Number two, we have the permission of the king to do what we are doing. Heaven and earth has accepted that we do this. That was a great motivation for the people because those who had faith, they trusted that if God is involved, I will uh, succeed. Those who didn't have faith, they knew if the king has given us permission, that's it, that's it. After that now, he started working. Started working. And today I want us just to look at a small portion of this passage, which is faith that does nothing is worth nothing. Verse 10, where we were. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelled near them came that they told us ten times. They told us ten times. From whatever place you return, they will be upon us. They told us ten times. First of all, look at uh, what is happening here. Sanbala, Tobias, uh, the Arab, and all the rest of the enemies began by ridiculing them, laughing at them, despising them, but now they have developed the opposition to a level of threatening. The opposition began like a mild uh, mockery. Uh, do you think you can do this work? Where will you get the energy? You are weak people. Where do you get the power to do it? Where will you get the material to do it? It began like a mild mockery, laughing at them. Then later, they started despising them that even if you build this wall, a fox can just walk on it and bring it down. They despise them. But now the opposition has graduated to a higher level of threatening. But now... It seems that these people are just not talking to Nehemiah. They are sending messages to the Jews who are there, to the workers. They are telling them, the moment you continue working on this, we are going to land upon you and kill you. The strength of the laborers is failing. This is what the people of Judah are reporting. The strength of the laborers is failing. Which means they have begun the work with vigor, with confidence, with the trust in what Nehemiah has told them, that God is on, on our side, that the king is on our side. They are so convicted with that. So they are really working, but their strength goes down. And that resonates well with all of us. At the beginning of anything, we have a lot of zeal. Every one of us, when you are beginning to do something, you have so much zeal for it. Even remember when you just got born again, and you wanted people around you to know that you are born again. You know, you'll talk to everybody about your salvation and about your new life and about everything because you are excited about your salvation. Remember that day you were appointed to a particular area of ministry in the church. You really showed vigor and zeal that you are the guy, you are the woman for that job. It happens with all of us. We began something so energetic, so, so assured, so ready to do it, but... 
with a little discouragement, we start going down. And what is the discouragement here? They have been told what? We'll kill you. Look at this. The strength of the labor is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. They are being discouraged even by the work itself. This is too much work. They are being discouraged. Eh? <laughs> you began like I'm the man, I'm the real guy. You know, you even discussed with people around and told him I'm the guy who's been given this job at, at this church. But a little discouragement, there's too much work here. There's a lot of rubbish I can't build now. I don't know what the rubbish is. The rubbish may be the people around you. The rubbish may be your mind, full of uh, discouragement. The rubbish may be real, real, real danger. There's rubbish around you. Too much rubbish. It's possible. It might be on two feet. It might be on two, four feet. It might be in the air, in, under the ground, in the water. It may be anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at verse 11. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause their work to cease. So the enemy has said, you can't do this work, I will kill you. If there is anything humanity fears is death. Anything that threatens your death, you rather leave that work even if God has said it. My son, go and do it. When you hear you will die, you say, but God, you can understand. But let me show you something good about death. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So if this verse had been written, then these people would not have feared by then. If, if they had uh, this verse in their scrolls. But unfortunately, the writer of this verse was not born by that time. So, and Christ had not died on the cross. But the Bible says here that me and you should never, ever be threatened by death. Amen? Actually, we will never die. We just pass on to a better life. You just happen to be in a good place. You leave people crying here because they don't know where you have gone. You look at them and wonder if these guys only knew where I am. They only knew. So we no longer fear death because Christ has died on the cross and taken away, taken away, the fear of death, if you have believed in him. If you have believed in him, there's no more fear of death. But these people were threatened with death. So this was a threat on their lives, and the workers were so discouraged. Now you can fill in whatever threatens you and makes you get discouraged. Is there sometimes you feel that if you give your money for God's service, you'll be a poor man? So sometimes you feel that you, your time is so precious, you don't want to give it unto God's service. You are too busy. Some of us behave like we are busier than even God himself. What is this that you threatens you and you feel like, I will lose so much. If I serve God, I will lose so much. You can replace that death with anything that weakens you, that limits you that inhibits you, that stops you from achieving God's purposes in your life. Then after you have replaced it with that, then we can move to how did Nehemiah confront it? Because one of the things that we are looking at is faith in action. Faith in action is never defeated. Because when you have faith, you know what you mean? It's God who is doing it through you. And God can never lose anything. Amen? We have people of faith here? Yes. What does Hebrews 11, 6 say? But without faith, it is impossible to please him as God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. You know, this is the biggest part of this. You believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek for him. So the first thing you need to understand is who God is. 
who God is. And the second thing you understand <clears throat> is that persisting in faith or a faithful service unto God has rewards. So you need to know the nature of God. And in this case here, you understand that it's the almighty God. is all-powerful. It doesn't matter what the enemy is planning. God is almighty. God is sovereign. God is eternal. In your time, God is very present there. God is love. We cannot just leave you to suffer. He's love. God is gracious. He's merciful. So you need to know this God. Then after you know this God, then you serve him faithfully, knowing that God is involved in this. He will see me through this. But again, after I've gone through this, he will reward me. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. So you see this is the perspective. You know him. What is the work of a high priest? To represent you or to present you before God. That's the work of a high priest. So seeing that we have a great high priest, we know that Christ Jesus is our great high priest. And now he is in heaven. We know that. So what follows is that let us hold fast on our confession. Confession. What do we profess about Christ Jesus? What do we say about him? What you know about him, hold fast on that one. Don't lose your confidence. In the midst of destruction, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of threats, in the midst of ridicule, in the midst of whatever kind of rebellion, don't lose your confidence. Hold fast on what you believe about Jesus Christ. Don't believe one thing today and tomorrow you are believing a different thing. I enjoy a small uh, chorus that uh, we normally sing and our ways are Imagine you sing like that and you see the way it brings some cool feeling in your heart. Eh? You, just want to see, you just want to concentrate on that God. Then anything comes your way and you are threatened. So are you lying when you are singing? Did you mean what you are singing? You cannot sing that and tremble at challenges that face you in your life. You cannot sing that and start being confused when you face opposition. Even in the midst of that opposition, you can still raise up your voice and say, Anaweza. In the midst of that opposition. You don't only sing when you are in church on Sunday and when you go home, you are threatened by a landlord and you are shivering. You can tell the landlord, just give me a minute, I go to the bedroom, I'm coming. And you kneel down and say, Unaweza. Then you come back and tell him, I'll see you next week. And he'll just go away. And you go and look for money. Don't wait upon the Lord. Go and look for the man. We hold tight to our confession. That which you believe about Christ Jesus, don't lose your faith in that. Hold tight on that. I don't know what you believe about Christ Jesus. If you believe he's your provider, hold on it. If you believe he's your savior, don't reach somewhere and say, you know, Jesus has saved me, but I can lose my salvation. Hold tight on what you believe. If you believe that he is Lord and master over you, hold tight on that. Because opposition will definitely come. Challenges will definitely come. And you will face betrayal from very close friends. You will face rejection from the people that you really love. The enemy will stand against you and oppose you in a very serious way. But in the midst of all that, I want you to mark this in your Bible. What do you do? Hold fast on. Hold fast on it. Once you hold fast on it, look at verse 15. Why should you do that? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus understands what you are going through as your high priest because he was also tested in all points. And if you want to see that, look at the time he has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and now the devil wants to tempt him and the devil asks him, if you are the son of God. When someone comes and asks you if you are a true believer, come on, Mokoka. How do you feel about that? Come on, Mokoka. We have a high priest 
who has been tempted even with wine in all ways but he understands when you face any temptation you know imagine when your advocate understands your pains you don't even have to explain too much to him you just say i did it he tells you well, i'll take care of the of the case because he understands he understands your weaknesses your limitations your challenges your is compassionate and the bible says he sympathizes with our weaknesses Christ just sympathizes with our weakness. So when you are being threatened with death, when you call upon him, he sympathizes with your weaknesses. Whatever threatens you, whatever makes you weak in your ministry, in your family, in your personal life, in your place of work, whatever makes you weak, understand that Christ understands. Amen? Amen. He understands and is able to help you. So look at, because he understands, uh, in, in verse 14, we have a great high priest. There's something that we know about that high priest that we need to hold fast on it. In verse 15, he sympathizes with us because he knows what we are going through. Therefore, in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Praise God. Boldly means what? You are not going to God with, with a doubt in your heart. You know he will help me. You know he's a good God. He loves me. He understands me. I may have fallen. I may be weak. I may be limited. I may be challenged in one way or the other. God understands me. And God is going to help me. Praise Jesus. Imagine approaching the throne of God with that confidence. You are not saying maybe or maybe not. No, you know he'll help. Let's go back to Nehemiah here. So they have threatened to kill. Verse 12. And our adversaries say they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to stop. So they have said they are not stopping at anything. You know, you know if, if you, are in, you have wronged the government and the police say we are not leaving any stone and, and turned. They are saying they are not stopping at anything. We are threatening you and don't think that there is anything that can stop us from achieving our purpose. Look at that. Verse 12. It was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times. They are saying, kwan, kwan we uski. You know when a person repeats ten times that that guy is sick. I'm telling you he's sick. You say it's okay. We are praying for him. Pastor, you don't understand. He's sick. You say it's okay. We, we are praying. Okay, can we, can we, Pastor, maybe you may not know what I'm telling you. He's sick. Ten times. So they are telling Nehemiah, Nehemiah says it's okay. I'll deal with it. Babe, Nehemiah, you don't understand. Why ten times? To show how threatened they were. To show how threatened they were. They said it ten times. <clears throat> From whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. They are saying we have no place to run to. There are so many times you feel like that, even in your own issues, you feel I've hit the wall. I've hit the wall. You don't know how to pray. You don't know how to act. You just feel helpless. You feel like uh, this is the end of it. We have no place to run. We have no place to hide. But think about it. You have been in worse problems before and the Lord has seen you through. If you remember. It's just that we are forgetful. If we were having a diary of the events of our day-to-day -day happenings, we remember that we have been in worse problems before and the Lord has seen us through. Do you remember that day? Yes. Yeah. So if you can remember that the Lord did it for me, when this situation was impossible, I had no strength, I had no capacity, I had no ability, I had, no with, I had nothing, no understanding of how to face this situation, but the Lord just did it for me. Praise God. If you can remember that, then you can hang your faith on that. If he did it for me that time, he can do it for me today and forever. But these guys are saying we have no place to run to. There are times you can look for money in your house, even a shilling is not there, even under the bed. You know those shillings that fall and roll under the bed and you forget about them? 
You go through all your jackets, maybe you forgot 50 shillings there, nothing. Nothing. And all you want is just money to buy a packet of milk for the children. Or just to go to town to meet somebody who can help you. He doesn't want to send with them pesa. He wants you to convince him. By the way, a good, a good husband, you just forget some money in your clothes. Not that you have forgotten, but you just forget. At least watch a cataout up of your TV. It's good manners. Sometimes when you come home and there's food and you say, pesa, tu. Nanizako. So you can reach there, like these guys who are saying that uh, wherever we turn to, where, from wherever place you turn, they will be upon us. Haven't you heard that if you, you fold your hands a little bit, you sleep a little bit, poverty will be upon, <laughs> upon you like upon a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. Poverty can come upon you until your name changes to poverty. During those old days, there's a song we used to sing. To say, Fungeni Milango Anakuja. And sincerely, you can reach there when neighbors say, Hey, Funga Milango. <laughs> you have nowhere to turn to. So, what do we do at that time? Let's go to verse, verse 13. Therefore, I position men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. It, it reaches that level that this personal now. You understand, if I don't do anything, these people here, my brethren, my wives, my sons, my daughters, my houses, will be destroyed. So now, you are rise up, but understand, the Lord is great and awesome. Awesome is means that he is worthy to be feared. Yeah? You are now putting your hands to work, not in your own strength, but knowing that God is with me and he'll give me victory over my enemies. All you need at that time that you are down is motivation to do something about your situation. Now let me tell you this. And I want you to hear, trials, challenges, opposition, destructions, rejections, betrayals, they come your way so that you can put your faith on exhibition. God wants you to exhibit your faith. He wants you to demonstrate your faith. There's no trial that comes your way to bring you down. Every trial that comes your way is because God has confidence in you. That he has placed in you or he wants to use you to achieve his purpose on earth. He wants to demonstrate his power, his glory, his excellence. And you are the man he has chosen to use. So when you freak out, you are telling God I have no trust in you. Faith that does nothing is worth nothing. Write that in your notes. Faith that does nothing is worth nothing. And it's biblical, James chapter 2, verse 17. This nonsense of saying, I am trusting God, I'm believing God, we need to come out of it. Amen? Amen. And put your hands on something. Verse 17. That's also faith by itself. If it does not have works, what is it? It is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now look at this. This is the most interesting part. 
you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. What is the difference? The demons know the power of God. They know the nature of God. They know the sovereignty of God. And when they think about it, they tremble. But the one thing the demon will never do is to respond to that. The demon will never worship God, honor God, serve God, but they, ha they believe that God is powerful. They believe that God is sovereign. They believe that God is the creator of the world and everything that is in them. But demons and Satan himself will never bow down and worship God. Now this is how it's being demonstrated to you. When you say you have faith and you don't do anything, you are being compared to a demon that knows that God is there but does not worship him. What a comparison. This thing of saying that we believe, we believe, we believe. Put to practice what you believe. Amen? Demonstrate what you believe. Let's have an exhibition of believers here. Everybody putting to practice what you believe. Letting the world know that there's a believer in this place. I don't know what you believe about God. I don't know what you believe about God concerning your life. I don't know what you believe about God concerning your family, concerning the church, concerning your ministry, concerning your gift, your calling, your talent. I don't know what you believe. But if there's something you believe God, then don't just believe, do it. Luke chapter 18. Let's just go there quickly. When Jesus taught us how to handle our faith, verse 1 to verse 8, I think. This is what he says. Then he spoke a parable to them, that the man always ought to pray and not lose heart. Are you seeing that? So Jesus is speaking a parable to the disciples, and the purpose of the parable is that man always ought to pray. What is the meaning of ought? Must. Does that look like a request? Pray when you feel like? Pray when there's uh, enough sunshine? Or when it's not raining? Or when you are not tired, or when you have time, men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Men should always pray. Should. Must. Ought. On Friday we were saying, when we pray in the name of Jesus, we pray in cons consistent with his will, with his plan, with his purpose, consistent with his character, with his uh, nature, with his power. So now you are praying consistent with his promises, with his word. Men always ought to pray. And then there are two things there. You always ought to pray even when you are not seeing the evidence of what you are praying for. You see that? Even when it's not happening, if God has set your heart on it, pray. Amen? Pray. <clears throat> now this is the parable. There was in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Verse 3. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. So she had adversaries. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wears me. Verse 6, then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. Are you seeing that? He may bear long with them, he may be along with you, but the Bible says he'll avenge. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Are you holding fast 
in your prayer, are you holding fast or you are caving into temptation? You are caving into trials. You are caving into opposition. Are you caving into rejection? Are you caving into betrayal? Are you starting to say that this thing cannot happen? I think I didn't hear right what God talked to me. Are you giving up in the middle of the journey? You are the one God is talking about. Don't lose your heart. Don't tell people that children of these days are like that. Persist in prayer. Persist in correction. Persist in loving your children. Don't say they're just like that. God cannot give you children who are like that. Refuse. Your children are not supposed to be lost in drug addiction. You can persist in prayer. There may be no evidence because the more you pray, the more they come home inebriated. In but you can persist in prayer and say, God, I know you gave me these children and my children cannot go this direction. You can refuse. The problem is we lose faith in the middle of the journey. We say, maybe that's the will of God. The will of God is for our welfare. There's no but God is willing here that you go without food. But you are a poor man. You are the one who is poor because Jesus said the poor you will always have. He did say about you. You are not the one he said. Put your hands on something. Answer katakata maembe moja ukiuzio watu. Tafuta pineapple moja unue mia. Uuze itoe mia mbili. Wacha uzembe. I know you want to own a supermarket but go slowly. Go slowly. Begin somewhere. I told you last time, if you are waiting upon the Lord, do what the waiters do. What do they do? The waiters serve. Laziness is killing the church. And then we are blaming it on God. We are blaming it on God. You don't have food, you blame it on God. You are walking naked, you blame it on God. You don't have school fees, you blame it on God. Arise. Arise. Put your hand on something and God will bless it. Amen? amen. Do you believe what I'm telling you? Amen. Then shout a better Amen. Therefore, I position men behind the lower parts of the wall. So you see what Nehemiah is doing now. He has a strategy and is implementing the strategy. Nehemiah has a plan. He's implementing the plan. He's not running away. He's not trembling like everybody else. He knows if someone is coming to attack us, you don't lock yourself in the house. You prepare to send him away. Do you know the story of uh, the lepers who said... Eh, we have no food. And we are faced with one thing, death. So we have a choice to sit here and wait for death or to go and look for food. You have a choice, my brethren. You have a choice to fold your hands and cry and say you are waiting upon the Lord. You are a woman of faith. You are a man of faith. You have a choice to do that and you will die in that position. But you have a choice like that leper to put your foot out and say, let's, let's look and look for food. We don't know where we'll get for food, but let's just go and look for food. And God will use those small steps you are making to terrify the enemy. <laughs> Amen. It's possible. Why are these things written in the Bible? Is it not for our learning? It's for our learning. So, Nehemiah has a strategy. He begins positioning men. And he puts a man and his children and his wife and his, uh, all the together, he tells him, fight here. So when the man is fighting, he's looking at his children. He's looking at his wife. You know, he's looking at his mother. He knows this people's life depends on me. How do you fight when you know that? Eh? You shoot to kill. <laughs> but you know something? Let me tell you something. The enemy never attacked. He never. When he perceived the preparedness of Nehemiah, he never attacked. The enemy always looks for a weakness to attack. When you show strength, when you show your faith in God, the enemy never attacks. The Bible says if you submit to God, he will flee away. Ananguruma to kama. Si simba, kama. Something else here is that Nehemiah had skills and tools. You don't go to work without tools. He had skills and tools, and he must have sought for them. Verse 14, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, so he, he speaks now to those who are leaders, remember the Lord great and awesome. So he always points people back to God, 
remember God. As you are fighting, remember God. As you are working, remember God. As you are resisting, remember God. Remember God. Remember God. That's why Paul says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Verse 15, and it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall and everyone to his work. So the enemy is hearing also. He's hearing. He has ears. He has ears. He's hearing that you are, you are well prepared for him. And he says, okay, I'll come back another time. I'll try another time. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shield, the bows, and the warm armor. And the leaders were behind all the houses of Judah. Judah. Leaders. You know, they are working. Eh? I want you to look at that. They are working on the wall. There are those who have the armor there. But leaders are the ones on the front. If the enemy comes, he kills the leader first. This is the position of the leader. Jesus says, I'm a good shepherd. I'm not like a hireling. Because a hireling, when he hears that there's an enemy coming, he takes off and leaves the sheep. But a true shepherd, you stay at the gate. If an enemy comes, he deals with you first before he goes in the sheep. And that's why we are so privileged to have Christ Jesus as our shepherd. He's always at the gate. You can see the work is going on. There's organization. There's leadership. And now you can see the sectional leadership. Every department has a leader. You see that? The sectional leadership. Nehemiah is not taking upon himself all the entire work as the leader. He is also relegating, delegating some of the work to some sectional leadership. Praise Jesus. Faith that does nothing is what? Is worth nothing. So always be reminded every time you face challenges, trials, testings, know that is the perfect opportunity for you to demonstrate your faith. So Nehemiah prayed continually for divine guidance and help. But you can see at every stage, he also continued giving new directions, new strategies, new plans, new tools, because you, the tools you begin with may not be the tools you'll finish with. The strategy you began with may not be the strategy you need at the middle of the battle, may not be the one you need at the finishing. The battle is changing. The battle is changing. Now you need a spear. You need something else. You need something else. You need a bow. You need new strategies and being equipped newly every day. We may not need that spear, but we are being equipped by the word of God. Praise God. That's why we are told to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So our equipment may be you, you are understanding the word of God better. You are uh, now relying on the word of God better. Better wisdom now because you can face this thing in a better way. So you have better spiritual power to handle this and now you are well equipped for that. So at every stage of your life, you need to be equipped afresh. You need to be given tools to face the situation and you need to be encouraged at all times. You need to pray. You need to rely on God. You need to know that God is in sovereign control of the situation. But God being in sovereign control does not mean you stay away and allow God to do it. He will never do it. Don't give to God that which he left in your hands to do. Amen? God will do it. God will never do it. God wants to do it through you. So you will do it. Praise God. Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It's not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty for all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You will never ever perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You're welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive, 
directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya.